is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Veronica Mars, Season 3, Episode 11, Poughkeepsie, Tramps, and Thieves. In this episode, a gentleman thinks that he has met the love of his life at Comic-Con, but it turns out his friend's really wanted him to get laid and set him up. An episode in which sex work isn't handled as badly as it could have been, but not as well as I wanted it to be. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very, very much to Anyas for commissioning this episode. Um, I want to alert you guys who are listening that the next episode is the last Veronica Mars episode that has been commissioned. So uh, I know that there are like 10 more left for the season. And people have mentioned wanting me to do like the new season that came out. So I just wanted to give you guys a heads up that, um, you know, I don't want there to be too much of a gap between. So, um, so yeah, this episode, man, I am, I'm going to go through it beat by beat because things sort of unfold in a certain way, but off the top, I just have to talk about the fraught nature of any TV show that deals with sex work and the like inherent cringiness of how often it doesn't stand up when it's any amount of time has passed. It's worse the further back you go. But even as recently as this show was made, I mean, shows are being made today that don't really handle this subject matter very well. And um, what's sort of like weird about this episode is that it goes back and forth between Wendy is the actual name of the girl that this guy gets involved with. I think she goes by Fiona is her like working name. Um, But the show sort of kind it feels like it can't really decide whether or not it wants to like make her into a truly sympathetic person or whether they, want to give her like all of this extra baggage. Um, I mean, not that baggage and being sympathetic are mutually exclusive, but I always am sort of on my guard because sex work is something that I personally feel really strongly about that. I think that it should be legalized. Sex work is real work. It's more work than a lot of jobs out there. And I always have said that if people have hangups about selling your body, then any kind of labor is out of the question. It's just you, if you don't think that sex counts as the same kind of labor, that's because you have your own hangups about what sex means. And that's not how sex is viewed by everyone. Some people don't need sex to be a meaningful thing. And that doesn't make them any less of a human being. And I I just, you know, it's one of those like, it's going to always exist. Paying for sex has been, they call it the oldest profession for a reason. And our attempts to outlaw it have been wildly unsuccessful, led to so many women being in danger and unable to go to the police with, you know, any of uh, the, it could be that they suffer abuse at the hands of their pimps and handlers. It could be that they suffer abuse at the hands of clients. They could suffer abuse at the hands of police. And there's nothing they can do because they will be arrested. And um, it's often frustrating how sex work is conflated with like human trafficking, which is a totally different thing. Human trafficking is like people who are being abused and taken advantage of, and there is no consent there. And sex work in an ideal situation 
would be women who are empowered to choose their clients, women who are able to get health care and be sure that they are like protected from abuse because they can have recourse with the police. So just coming at this from that point of view, it's a really fraught episode. Um, so this kid who we've seen before, he um, is the one that, you know, hands out cheat tests and papers and whatnot. He, I don't remember his name actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but I have the episode up, so I'll just go. He goes to Veronica to find out if she can discover the name and whereabouts of a girl. Well, he says that he doesn't know her last name. We find out later he didn't actually know her first name either. But he wants to uh, find this girl that he met at Comic-Con. They had this like amazing evening together and really connected. And he had to rush her to the airport. She told him that she left her information for him in the hotel room. But by the time he got back to the hotel room, it was cleaned. And as far as he knew at the time, the cleaning ladies had thrown away whatever paper she had left with her phone number and whatnot on it. This is one of those things that like, Max, thank you, Rachel. This is one of those things that really on the outset, the story sounds fishy because if a girl wants to give you her number, writing it down and leaving it somewhere for you to find later, especially if it's not like your home that she left it at, where you're guaranteed to go home and find it. If it's in a hotel room, that's not the way a lady who really wants to see you again would have handled it. She would have given you her number at the time that you drop her off, written it on your hand or a piece of paper or whatever before she got on the plane. Or she would just not tell, talk about it. She wouldn't mention it. So already my sort of like antenna were up when he mentioned that and I was feeling like, and then he tells Veronica uh, that he got a text from her that she was marrying somebody else and that she had waited for him to get in touch, but he never did. And she was tired of waiting. And he, when he comes to Veronica, his whole thing is like, you need to stop her from getting married. I need to find her. But when Veronica asks him, well, how did she text you? Like, then you have her number. He says, no, when I call the number, it was some guy who answered who says he doesn't know anything about, I think, I think the name that she went by was Chelsea, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, was it? Um, I think her name changed. She went by Chelsea when he knew her. And then she went by like Fiona on the site when they went and searched for her again. Um, <clears throat> and Veronica is able to question the person when she calls them herself and he turns out to go to their school. So another bit of radar going off, you know, the fact that this dude is just, the, the number is at the school they're both at. Also, he says when she asks to see the text message, he says, I showed it to my friend, but he accidentally deleted it. So again, I'm just like, he accidentally deleted it. How? Like that's, you have to go through a couple steps to delete a, a text from somebody's phone, especially when it's like an older phone, like in this show. And as it turns out, it's because his friend is in on this whole thing and wanted to keep this kid from being hung up on oh, an imaginary woman. So Veronica tracks down the dude whose phone the text came from. And there is a guy working with the dude who she recognizes from a photo in Max's dorm room. And she puts it together that this dude borrowed his coworker's phone to send that text. As it turns out, his two friends got together and each threw in $500 to hire a sex worker to pretend to be into him in the hopes that he would get laid and it would raise his self-esteem. This is one of those things that um, I really want to know, does this ever happen? 
in the world. Because I have seen this sort of plot before where guys are like so hellbent on their friend getting laid and they decide to go the route of a sex worker. And I find the the preoccupation with whether a friend has had sex bizarre to the extreme. It's one thing to really hope that your friend finds somebody and is happy. It's one thing to like want the best for them and know that maybe they're lonely or they've been broken hearted a couple times and you feel bad about it. But literally, why do you give a fuck if he got his dick wet? Like, what is in it for you? Why are you worried about it? And especially like Max, when he winds up finding out what the situation was, he says very sincerely, in my opinion, in a way that I believed, I have had opportunities I just am much more selective than they are. And I didn't want to sleep with those people. It's not about that for me. And um, Rachel says, I wonder that too. Like, why would they care? Exactly. I, it's just one of those things that it feels like such a sort of weird trope in, especially like 90s and early 2000s, young TV and movies that men were just absolutely hell bent on getting their friends laid. And I can't help but wonder if that was at all ever based on reality, or if it was just something that was manufactured for plots, and then got sort of picked up as a thing in reality, because art does like it, it life imitates art upon occasion, you know. Um, so anyway, yeah, this kid finds out And rather than have the reaction that I think a lot of us might expect, which is humiliation and this sort of sense of like, I can't believe this, none of this was real. He instead is much more like, well, whether she was paid or not doesn't change the fact that we clearly had something. And Veronica is extremely skeptical because of course she is. Now, I think that my main problem this season, beyond like, obviously, how poorly handled the rape storyline was, I'm noticing this recurring theme that did exist in previous seasons, but I feel like is being leaned into a lot more this season than others, which is Veronica thinks the worst of people is so deeply cynical that she can't even conceive of the idea of people actually being like good hearted or wanting the best for each other. And then she's proven wrong by somebody who surprisingly has a heart of gold or really did want something for their friend. Or, and it's happening over and over again in a way that feels formulaic to a point that's boring. Like, when he says that he thinks they really had something and Veronica's so skeptical, my response was immediately, well, obviously based on her reaction, they did have something and she's going to be proven wrong and find out that, you know, oh, she didn't know what she thought she knew. And indeed that does seem to be the case. She and Logan, um, there is like apparently this, uh, site where you can like make selections about what someone looks like, the kind of kinks they cater to, etc. And she um, goes through it with the friends that hired this woman in the first place. And they discover a couple of women who look pretty close to what they think this girl looked like, but they're not positive. And then she uses Logan's money and Logan's help to hire these women to come to the hotel room while Max is there and he can greet each of them and, you know, tell them, is this the girl or not? So a couple girls show up and are not the ones, but they pay them each anyway for their time, which I really appreciated, to be honest. And then actual Wendy shows up and it's obvious from the way that she reacts to seeing Max that she definitely cared about him. Which makes their decision later to t- have her 
tell him she didn't leave her information for him after all. M- very frustrating to me. It felt like, th- and this is kind of what I meant in the beginning of the show when I said that I I felt like they went back and forth on how they wanted to handle her. It seemed like they wanted to have her actually like into Max and sort of fall for him. But they also wanted her to be kind of cold blooded about it to the point that she would like lie and vanish on him. And that didn't really work for me. I I kind of felt like from the way that she behaved here, it seemed like she really was very, v- there was a connection. Like she really was very interested. And I didn't understand the choice to have her like lie and tell him that her info was there and it wasn't like it just, I understand that she had been hired for a job by his friends and maybe that was supposed to be part of the job, but I don't know. It just, it was an odd choice to sort of in the end have her, it it felt like what they wanted to do was be like, I did really like you, but in the end it was just a job. And I felt uh, like a little bit let down by that. On the one hand, there's a certain amount of realism to it. So I respect it in a way. But on the other hand, I just really wanted them to let her be happy. And it felt like they just didn't quite want to do that. Like there was a, a part of the script that was heavily about would somebody be able to live with the fact that their significant other had been engaged in sex work, had been a stripper, and they couldn't conceive of somebody being at peace at peace with their significant other's past if they had been a sex worker. And I kind of feel like that's one of those things that really sound, feels a lot more puritanical than maybe they intended when they wrote it. But it's just sort of to me, it it is more about the writers than the character, because it turns a corner at a very specific moment. You know, there's a whole bit of intrigue, and I'll get into that. But to jump ahead to what I'm talking about here, she is uh, with him in the cafeteria and Weevil walks up. And it turns out that he recognizes her from when she was a stripper. And he mentioned specifically a tattoo that she had had probably on her ass because when they talked to her manager, she says that she got a tattoo removed for this girl. She paid for it and that it wasn't cheap. And it's part of the money that this girl supposedly owes her. And um, it's just this moment of this kid, Max, like sitting back and looking at her and realizing the way that, people might see her and the fact that she isn't quote his in the way that he wants her to be. And this is such a thing in society is that like, you know, well, why would a guy want gum that's already all chewed up? And there's a hundred percent that vibe here coming from Max, where it's like the fact that other people have seen her naked bothers him. And yet he knew full on that she was a sex worker. And it's not until he hears that somebody saw her strip that he really seems to get like kind of agitated about it. I'm like, dude, stripping is much tamer than fucking. So if you were okay, in theory, with the idea that she had been having sex for money, the fact that she was a stripper should be much less upsetting to you, I would think. But it seems like it's more the fact that Weevil knows her, recognizes her, and has seen her naked versus some, you know, like one of her clients we find out is this like Senator. And that is distant enough for Max, I think that he doesn't believe that will intrude on their lives and that people won't know and it won't be a problem anymore that she can just sort of walk away from that part of her life, and it won't affect them. And um, eventually, his roommates, like, when she says something about how she needs to get a job, his roommates are like, oh, we we actually have a job. My brother's, uh, you know, he's he's trying to plan a bachelor party because he's getting married and they didn't hire a stripper and we're looking for somebody. 
And Dan, or Dan, Max gets really mad at them suggesting this. And he says something that like, that's my girl you're talking to. And that wording to me was really telling. And she says something about how, well, I'm retired, actually. To the roommate's credit, they both seem embarrassed at the fact that they like put this out there and they back off really quickly. And they're like, I'm really sorry. But it's the fact that they assumed this at all that seems to bother Max a lot. And it just, it really was a shame that it started off as a love story where Max wasn't, wasn't going to be preoccupied with what she used to do for a living. And was so excited to have met somebody who was beautiful, who had shared his interests and that he had a real connection with. Now, granted, we don't know how much of her his interests she actually shared. I would have liked a little bit of the two of them, like, connecting on a topic that previously we know she had been coached on what to say, but actually being like pretty into it. We don't get any of that. The only connection that we really see is a purely like, a physical reaction, the two of them being all over each other where, when they're in Logan's hotel room. And I would have liked to see more of what they have in common, really, because maybe if it turned out they didn't have those things in common and she wasn't into the things that he was into, it would feel a little bit more reasonable that he starts to realize this isn't what he hoped and thought it would be. But instead, it seems like it's entirely due to the fact that she is was a sex worker. And um, it just really made me sad that the story is about somebody who thinks they are okay with that, and then they aren't. And the note that she leaves for him is like, you fell for me when you didn't know what I was. And now that you know, it shows in the way you look at me and it shows in the way you touch me. And that is heartbreaking, guys. That is, she herself thought that she had found somebody too. And he doesn't accept her. And, you know, I feel like this is sort of set up like he got taken for a bunch of money. And granted, she's like paying him back by the end of the episode. But it's sort of treated like we should be sorry for him. And I'm much sorrier for her because this guy sort of like promised it would be fine and then acted as if she was like diseased and he just didn't want to have anything to do with her. So them adding on top of his feeling this way, asking whether she really left her information for him in the hotel Honestly, her acting in this scene, I thought she as an actress was really good. Um, but he asks the question and you can see on her face as he's asking that she knows what it, the question's going to be. And she is honest with him and tells him she didn't leave her information. And she starts crying and is like, I wish I had. And he just gets up and leaves and she's left sitting there, obviously like heartbroken because she can see it's over that this is just it. And it was a bummer, man. It broke my heart a little bit to see this woman who like, you know, she's been through stuff here for a minute and she keeps being suspected by Veronica of being shady for a number of reasons. First, Veronica thinks that they couldn't possibly have had a real connection because the woman was paid and she was faking whatever affection he thought she had for him. Then eventually, um, when they meet up and they, it seems like there's something between them. Uh, this girl who looks like she's been like beaten up shows up at Logan's door and tells her, you took off, you owe her like uh, Mr. Happy Fist, this is what she calls him, all this money. And until you pay him back, they're going to keep doing this to me. And apparently she owes like a thousand dollars is what she, this girl says at that time. And um, Max gives her the money and they leave together with this sort of like understanding, I think, that she has to go back, that she doesn't have a choice. And so he basically gives her a thousand dollars and is about to just say goodbye to her, which is uh, 
really sweet and good hearted of him. And as they leave, Veronica looks at the ice pack this girl had on her eye and sees that there's all this makeup on it and realizes that the girl hadn't actually been beaten. It was makeup and that she was faking it. And she thinks that Wendy was a part of the con and assumes this was all a big setup in order to get him to fork over a thousand dollars. So Veronica's bright idea here is to blackmail the Senator for money to get his money back from him for him. What? Am I alone in being absolutely bewildered at the handling of this? Because I gotta be honest, this feels wildly out of character for Veronica to me. It's so like the whole like, oh, get a locker at such and such and text me with the locker and the locker number. There are so many ways in which this could go wrong for her. So many ways in which somebody could just be standing there watching to see who goes to the locker and then follow you home and assault you or kill you to keep you quiet or God knows what. This is like a big deal. And it's treated very casually. Like it's not only not a big deal to do, but that Veronica doesn't uh, like understand the depth of the danger that she could be in doing this. And I, it, it felt so out of left field and so strange. I didn't understand this, this like turn the story took at all. As it turns out, she like calls the Senator, I guess, again, like, how you just like have a senator's direct line and can call and threaten them. Oh, and she says something like, well, it can't be traced. Let me use your phone to max. And I was like, how is that? Of course it's traceable. What? I just, there was so much about it that just did not make sense to me. And um, in the end, when she goes to the locker, there's a note that says, get in the limo outside or when he gets hurt. And when they go outside, there is a, uh, Rachel says, I think he's a judge and she knew him somehow. Oh, he's a judge. I keep saying Senator. You're right. He is a judge. Um, I mean, she knew about his, her father's hangups about the guy because he had taken bribes and still got reelected is something that she had said. But I just, even so being able to call a judge up personally and like, make this kind of threat on your friend's cell phone and be so certain that nobody's going to be able to trace that back to anybody. I don't get why she's so confident about that. Um, yeah, anyway, so she goes outside and the limo, it turns out that uh, the woman inside is Wendy's manager. And she claims that Wendy owes her like $10,000 because she's been paying for her room and board. She paid for her clothing. She paid for tattoo removal. Um, just basic maintenance is hugely expensive, you know, getting her hair done, probably waxing, all of that stuff costs a lot of money. So she, it's sort of like an indentured servant situation where you take on a debt getting into the job at all. And then as you work, you're meant to be paying off your debt until eventually you are earning the money for yourself and not paying anybody debt back. Allegedly, that's how it's supposed to go. I don't know how honest this lady is about how much people owe, but she says 10000 and immediately Max says he'll pay it. And Veronica is just bewildered. Like, dude, really? But you know, she says a couple key things that make Max still have hope that Wendy was really stupid because she fell for a client, ran off without telling me. She really makes it sound like everything that it looked like was going on initially is actually what was happening and that Wendy wasn't playing a con, that she really did fall for Max, that she really did attempt to leave. So Max is like wrapped up and he's like, all right, let's go to my bank. To which I'm just like, who are you 
teenage boy or 20 something boy that you have $10,000 in your bank account to give her. What? How? Really? When? What? I mean, I am sure you make a tidy profit selling papers and tests, but $10,000 that you can just spare. Uh, okay. Mm, doesn't make sense for me, but fine. So he pays it. And the next time that we see them, they're in the cafeteria and it's that encounter with Weevil, which sends things sort of like spinning out of control. And, um, you know, this whole time, Veronica has just been so certain that this woman is like kind of playing with him, that there's a bigger game. And it is just continuing to be clear, this girl does really care about him. And yeah, he's saving her. But it seems like whatever they have is actually real. And she even cops to that in person eventually. But finally, he comes to her and tells her that Wendy left. And Veronica again jumps to the worst conclusion and thinks that Wendy got one over on him, let him spend 10 grand on her to get her out of her situation, and then she just left. And he reads the note that Wendy left and shows Veronica that she's already given him $1,000 to pay him back. Like it's part of the beginning of paying him back. And evidently she went back to working I guess in like in sex work in order to pay him back. Um, which is sort of like it's a, he, he paid to get her out of her situation. So I guess we're going to go with the idea that the indentured servitude thing did work out for her and he paid her debt. So she's not obligated to stay, but she can go back to work and make her own money. Um, Rachel says, as a stripper, maybe that's what the $1 implied to me. Oh, you're right. I forgot that he says, I hope you don't mind getting paid in ones. You're right. Okay. So that's what she said. Because I was about to be like, ain't no job that I can think of that you go back to and make a thousand dollars, you know, in a couple days. But stripping would be one of them. That or waiting tables somewhere really nice. Um, God. Yeah, I just so this it's just it's a weird episode where it, there's a, a whole bunch of stuff that comes up between Veronica and Logan about um whether or not he has been with a prostitute before he says no i don't believe him i'll just say that either he's straight up lying to veronica i don't get the sense in the show that they intend for him to be lying, though. It felt in that scene like he was being honest with her. And I am expected to believe that Logan has not slept with a sex worker. I don't buy it. Logan orchestrated bum fights at the beginning of this show. I absolutely believe that the dude who spends weekends in Tijuana with his creepy dude rapist friends a hundred percent was out with sex workers i mean he he's not only an asshole surrounded by other assholes he's an asshole with money of course he's been to sex workers a thousand percent so i'm being asked to believe that he has not been with them and i don't buy it and I feel like it's another part of the show, like trying to get me to think that he's like a better person than they have set him up to be. And I'm just really frustrated with Logan overall and the whole thing with him. I just don't care about him as a character at all anymore. And Veronica brings up the whole thing with uh, Mercer again and the, you know, the burning down of the hotel that they were in. And asks Logan, like, how is it possible that shit went down the way that you said? And Logan, first of all, acts really irritated that she's bringing this up again. He acts like it's her, like, unwilling to take his word on 
what went down at work today or something. When, dude, you were involved in a fire and fled the scene. You were responsible for it. Stop acting like she's being petty. This is a big deal, dude. And finally, he tells her he doesn't know how Mercer could have pulled this off and says, maybe he drugged me or something. Which I am assuming he's saying because of Mercer's whole methodology with raping. And he think, he says, like, I, I thought it was only a few minutes. Maybe it was a couple of hours. I don't understand how she's buying this. She seems to believe him in this moment. And I can't imagine the Veronica that we have seen as suspicious and cynical as she is like listening to this line of garbage and swallowing it. It just doesn't work for me. It, like, oh, I have no idea how long I was out. I have no idea how he could have come back and, and raped a girl and then come back before I noticed he was gone. And I really wish you'd stop bringing it up. What? I just... I gotta be honest, you guys, I do not know what explanation for all of this I could be given by the end of the season that would warm me to Logan again. I feel like the Logan ship has sailed. I'm not on it. And I have no interest in catching up with it. I don't think there's any way for them to turn that thing around. It's just strange that they're clinging to it the way they are. They, the two of them had pretty great chemistry in what the end of season one was it when they sort of hooked up. Um, and I felt like that worked really well back then. Fast forward to now, they don't have chemistry together anymore. I don't know why. I don't know what could have happened to like cause that to just dissipate. But I don't think it's there. And the amount of like lying and and massaging of his history that they're trying to do just doesn't sit right with me at all. Also, I should mention that, you know, they had only just gotten back together. And we don't see uh, what's his face at all this episode. I keep wanting to call him Tapper. And then I'm going to call him Jake. I feel like I call him Jake in my head a lot. What's the name of this guy? Um, Rachel's Oh, no, not Dick. Rachel, that's I'm talking about the guy that was uh, into Veronica that there was a scene where it seemed like she was Piz. Thank you. I can't remember his name ever. It's a bad name. That's why. Uh, but yeah, we don't see him at all this episode. And I thought we were going to tap her. I know. I don't know where I got that. Um, but yeah, I sort of thought we were going to see him like mooning around feeling sad that Veronica got back together with Logan and, you know, it's just he's not an entity at all this episode, which was sort of like just a little bit disrespectful, honestly, like, damn, OK. Um, so. All right, let's talk about what's going on with the investigation with the dean and Veronica's dad. Um, so we have a, a brief scene right at the beginning, actually, where Weevil is talking about how uh that because there's an article in the student newspaper about all of this property being egged after the uh, fraternities were brought back into the community and they were allowed to reband. And rightfully, Weevil's like, you know, these bitches throw this shit acting like they're really giving the finger to the faculty. And we are the ones that have to clean that shit up. And he mentions something and let me go to the actual clip. Um, she is showing him the um, where the egg was launched and they have this whole like graphic here. And he says, I can't believe how dumb these people are mad at the Dean. So the egg is window. Like he's the one who has to clean it up. And she says the Dean's window, it doesn't mention the Dean's window. And he says that night they egged the Dean's office too. I don't know why they didn't put that in there. Maybe they couldn't find a way to make it funny. 
And then he says, the Dean was a good guy, you know, it's a damn shame. And Veronica is clearly sort of interested in the fact that this isn't mentioned in the article. Nobody seems to even be aware this is true, but somebody had to have known it happened. And then we cut to her dad, who is at the police station. Um, and he's picking up the file on the suicide. And he runs into Sheriff Lamb, who kind of mocks him, always looking for crime where there isn't one. I think you need a new hobby. And Keith says, oh, I don't know. I find solving an investigation very relaxing. You should give it a try sometime. And Sheriff Lamb doesn't get it right away and just goes, yeah, I'll get right on that and sort of smirks. And then as Keith leaves, it registers and he gets this look on his face like, wait, and then it cuts, which is actually pretty funny. Um, so Veronica tells her dad about what she found out. And he's, uh, you know, surprised at the fact that this isn't mentioned anywhere in the police report either. Like one would think that even if it's not in the student newspaper, that the police would at least also be aware of it. Um, but no. And he says, it also looks like the report was done by a 10th grader. So I guess I'm not that surprised that some things got left out. Um, so she explains to him about the girls from Lilith house and how they are activists and they have a problem with the Greeks and, um, Nish was the editor at the newspaper. When Odell fired her, she swore he'd regret it. They went on an egging spree the night of his suicide and says, do you mind? And he says, do you mind talking to them to her? And she's like, yeah, I don't think we're going to be doing that. Um, so what he does is impersonate a police officer, which, uh, I guess that's one way to handle it. I really expected him to be a little bit less illegal about the way he went about this. But not only does he dress up like a cop, he's pretty aggressive, too. He goes over to their house, they open the door, and he basically is like, can I come in and doesn't wait for an answer and just shoves his way into the room, which, you know, as women... A dude does that and all your alarm bells start to go off and you assume that this isn't a real cop like I would. That's not how I would expect a cop to behave when he and don't get me wrong, a cab for sure. So if you are a minority of any kind, probably they would act like this and you would not be surprised. But we're dealing with a bunch of attractive white college girls. Eventually, there is a woman of color, but she isn't in the room immediately. And so one would think that a cop would behave a different way. And he comes in and begins to grill them about their throwing eggs. Where were they? Uh, that the office was egged and did they have anything to do with that? Because if they were in the vicinity, then they might have seen something. And one of them says that Nish was with them. And the other says, no, she wasn't not when we went to such and such. And he really laser focuses on that and is like, all right, well, where was Nish? What was she doing? And don't you dare lie, he says. Like, he feels like real dad energy in this scene in a way that I didn't feel worked for what he was trying to do. But Nish, unfortunately for him, is right in the next room and hears the whole conversation and walks in like kind of cackling like, dude, are you serious? I know who you are. This guy isn't a cop. And eventually she's like, you know what? What the fuck do I care? I'll tell you where I was because I don't have anything to hide. Um, and I forget where she even says that she was. Let me fast forward to that spot, even though Ultimately, I don't think it really matters because I don't believe that she is responsible for what happened. I don't like, you know, she just doesn't say murderer to me in any way. Um, yeah, I've got nothing to hide. I went ar uh, around and egged the Dean's car, the Volvo that he loved so much. And this is the first time that all of the girls have heard the theory that the Dean was murdered and didn't kill himself. So, 
once her friends inform her that's the suspicion he's working on her bravado sort of deflates and you can see her beginning to get really worried about where she was in proximity to a fucking murder victim what he finds out later is that the dean drove his wife's minivan that day so if this girl isn't lying and she did indeed egg his volvo that means that he that either his wife was there in his car which one would think she would have mentioned or who knows what other explanation there could be other than Nish is lying and she didn't make his Volvo. She, you know, was there doing something else or somebody else's Volvo by accident. But uh, the the whole thing doesn't exactly add up to him. Um, And I haven't got really any sort of theory on that. I, like I said, I don't think Nish did anything to the Dean. I really don't, by that. Um, I wouldn't think, though, that if his wife murdered him, she'd roll up in her car and go into his office and kill him and then hire Keith to investigate it. it that doesn't add up either. So either somebody borrowed her car in order to try and set her up or it was a different Volvo or a car that looked like a Volvo, although Volvos don't even just have a symbol that you could mistake for another symbol. Volvos say Volvo on the back. So I find it hard to believe that she would make that kind of mistake. Um, I have to think somebody like borrowed the car, stole the car, which to me points a little bit more towards the professor. But I have a feeling it's nobody that we are really too familiar with that's responsible for this. I just to me, it's going to probably be somebody that comes a little out of left field who turns out to be guilty. Um, so that's pretty much that with um, what's going on with uh, Keith. He does run into Sheriff Lamb at an intersection and Sheriff Lamb sees him dressed up as the cop and just kind of does a double take, but nothing comes of that really, which uh, I would really think Sheriff Lamb is always sort of gunning for Keith. I'm a little surprised that he didn't try and pursue him and get him in trouble for that because, I mean, I guess there's nothing that can be proven about what Keith was doing in that costume. So he could say anything about like, I was just at a party and there's not much that could be done about it. Um, But yeah, it's sort of a uh, weird moment where Keith is really blithe about the whole thing. So the last scene in the episode is uh, the one of the girls that came to the door, um, Logan's hotel room door, was, is it Madison? Is that her name? Um, and of course, like, Veronica assumes Madison is there to try and reconnect with Dick. And... <laughs> And Dick isn't there and she doesn't really say too much here and just sort of leaves. Um, But Veronica like gets an idea because of something that Wendy said that maybe she should go and try some lingerie, uh, which, you know, a favorite thing of mine back when I was like cute and adorable So she goes to what looks like it's supposed to be a Victoria's Secret or something. And she's looking around and Madison comes out of one of the dressing rooms. And Veronica is trying to be sort of like snotty with her. She really hates Madison. I'm going to be honest with you guys and say that I don't remember what her problem is with Madison. Is there something that happened that I'm forgetting or is it just a general sort of personality thing? Um, But regardless, Madison makes a comment about like why I don't know why I spend so much money on something that's going to get ripped right off me, but I can't resist. 
And Veronica says, if you're trying to get dick back, I don't think you have to work that hard. A hefty bag and some duct tape and he'll be good to go, which was honestly pretty good because that's true of many men. (laughs) But uh, Madison says, dick, please. And she says, you came over. I figured and she says, oh, Logan and I hooked up in Aspen over the holidays I guess you two were split, huh? I was in town and thought he might have some free time, but oh well. Oh, and um, as a friend, he's not so big on the one piece numbers. And then she walks away. And part of the conversation that Veronica had had with Logan past the... Uh, Let's see. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Rachel says, Madison is the one who gave her the drugged drink that led to her getting raped. Madison didn't know it was drugged, but she did spit in it before she gave it to her. And it was basically a vindictive bitch to her through all of high school. Thank you. I I really thought if it had been something that she did, it was like more recent. But I completely forgot about all that other stuff that happened like way back. Um. So one of the questions that Veronica asked after the whole, like, have you ever been with a sex worker thing was, oh, my God, I forgot about that. She's also the one who was switched at birth with Mac. (sighs) What a Jerry Springer thing to add into the show. I completely forgot about that. Womp womp. Um, So Veronica asks Logan whether or not he hooked up with anybody in the time that they were split up. And he says, I slept with one girl who meant absolutely nothing. And it honestly makes me sick when I think about it, which he says with a great deal of sincerity to me, I think he's being genuine when he says that. However, we saw that girl And she was bouncing up on top of him in the Jeep at the beach. I thought that was the one that he meant. Madison is something that I'm pretty sure none of us knew about, right? So is she full of shit and lying to Veronica to just fuck with her? Or is that a true thing that the audience just wasn't privy to at all? Because, Again, I don't trust Logan. So if he tries to deny that this happened, I'm not buying it because I just don't believe him anymore about things. And it's clear to me that Veronica is going to think when he said one girl that I hooked up with and I feel sick about it, she's going to assume it was Madison that he is referencing and think that's the only one, which is bad enough because Madison is personally a, somebody that she hates. So it feels like extra insulting. And second of all, Madison was standing right there in the room with them and he isn't telling Veronica. Yeah. I hooked up with specifically this person, which feels like he's concealing things in a different way, which I would be upset by were I her. And, Yet we know that there was a girl at the beach too, which if she's under the impression it's just Madison and then she finds out there was a second girl. That's a whole other lie as well. So what I'm saying is why are we still on Logan's team? What are we doing? Is this, can we all just agree this was a bad idea I don't get it. Like, I don't understand what we're still doing. He's not even particularly relevant in the plot anymore. He keeps sort of being roped into things, I think, in a lot of cases, because he has money and the plot needs Veronica to be able to pay for certain things, is what I really think is happening. She needs resources and the show doesn't know how to get them for her. And... Logan is a very convenient method of being able to shell over some cash to have, you know, four different sex workers come up and see which one it is. Like, it just seems like they don't really know what to do with him either. And they keep having him do things that are deeply unlikable and suspect. 
And I just don't really understand what it is they're aiming for here. So we'll see what happens from here. But uh, I, got, I just got to admit, I feel a way about it. And he, I mean, I was under the impression that he knew about what Madison did to Veronica. And if he, if it turns out Madison isn't lying, I don't have any reason to think she's lying. She seems like a shitty person, but lying about having slept with somebody is like such a risky move that it doesn't seem like something you would do unless you had formulated some sort of like plan surrounding it to create evidence about it with a very specific goal in mind. I don't know. Maybe she is just shitty enough to lie about that just to plant a seed. But I don't know. I I guess if you're just an agent of chaos and you just say, I slept with your boyfriend, that's enough of a seed to plant because you're just trying to be a dickhead. Even if you can't prove it, you'll know that seed of doubt will be in her mind forever. And maybe that's all she wants. But otherwise, like her turning up at the... uh the hotel room, it was kind of weird for her to come there when Dick isn't there because people don't just show up at each other's places if they're interested in spending the night together. They usually like plan it out. So I did think it was sort of strange for her to just roll around and be like, hey, is Dick here? It, it makes more sense to me that she showed up to talk to Logan. However, that would also imply that she didn't text Logan to ask him what he was up to either and was taken by surprise at the fact that Veronica was there. None of this really adds up. I don't know. So I'm very curious what that's going to turn out to be. Um, mostly because I just want them to drop him. And I'm I'm super curious, Rachel, like you were you watching this as it aired in real time? What was the attitude of the audience? Were were people shipping her and Logan and really like not wanting them to break up? Because like TV shipping is one of those things that I find to always be faulty. Anytime people are shipping characters on a TV show in real time, they're wrong most of the time. And I will look back at whatever it was and be like, oh, they slash we were idiots. Um, Rachel says, I'll admit I was too, but I was much younger. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just like one of those things that when you are watching a show, a lot of times you just wind up shipping people because of the fact that they had been together this whole time. And it just feels like you don't want to let a newbie into your group of people and you want there to be a happy ending and your happy ending doesn't involve some random showing up. You want the happy ending to be between characters that you've gotten to know, which is part of the problem because then you wind up with this whole weird, like dichotomy of, do I choose the guy for my favorite girl that I know really well and think is a good person for some reason? Or do I pick a stranger? And, the, or you can get into the like Hallmark movie thing where it's like, do I pick the um, the low key douchebag city boyfriend or the honest farmer with the golden retriever? And you do have to pick between those two because for some reason, those are the only two men who exist in the world. And that's all you get to choose between. So. Let's see. She says, you don't see the problematic things. You just see the amazing meant to be stuff. And so you get mad when they do things that are terrible, but also you want them to be forgiven and grow and change. Yeah, I can understand. It's like a Ross and Rachel thing, you know, whereas you look at that now, Ross and Rachel are no good together. Like Ross is terrible. And it's weird how I feel like Logan is sleepwalking through his lines this season Every time he's on screen, it feels like he's putting forth minimum effort. And I can't tell if that's like meant to be a part of his character because he's such a sort of lethargic guy who's been able to sail through things without a lot of effort as a person and a character. Or if it's the fact that the actor isn't really invested anymore either and is sort of phoning it in. I can't tell. But the two of them had had chemistry. And I feel like he had had more charm back when as well. And he doesn't 
have that for me anymore. He just feels a lot more dead weight. And he doesn't bring anything to the scenes he's in. So the the overall, there's just, it's not even like, I, I don't think they're good together, but I like him as a character and want him to stick around and do things. It just feels like he isn't bringing anything to the show. Um, she says, I just wonder if they weren't giving him enough to work with. I'm not super impressed with the writing this season, especially looking back. Yeah, I, I maybe it is that they're not giving him enough to work with. Um, I don't know, but I, I'm just kind of like, the the season is really lacking. I mean, that can't be denied. Overall, so far, I have found this season to be extremely disappointing and outright insulting a fair amount of the time. So that's its own whole thing. And maybe I shouldn't be surprised that the male love interest is hu- riddled with problems considering how they don't seem to know how to handle a lot of subject matter well in the first place. Um, but I, I'm just still like kind of holding on to this hope that they're going to come to their senses. And what did they, when they were writing this, know that this was the last season or were they writing this thinking that the show might get renewed again? Um, and I know there's one new season, although I've heard like very mixed things about it. And I think Anya said that she would want me to even cover the, um, graphic novels. I think if she was able to like cover those, which I didn't know those existed. Um, they were hoping for a renewal, just novels, not graphic. Okay. Um, I'm really interested in the novels as a concept and how that works, because it's one thing for something to be a book and be made into a TV show to do the other way around. I don't know at all how that looks. And I'm really curious. I've never read like the novelization of anything except for when I was in like fourth grade and I read part of the novelization of the fugitive, which is such an odd choice, but yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, the next episode, I think, isn't until January. Uh, let me double check this here. And then, like I said, there isn't one booked after that. So I am booked into February at this point, I think. Um, boop, boop, boop. Yeah, January 5th. Um, and that was booked by Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. So, all right. Uh, oh, and there's a movie. I didn't know that. When did the movie come out? Is that like older? I wonder how Kristen Bell feels about like going back and playing this character again after all this time. Five years ago. Not that long ago. Huh. All right. Cool. Well, I guess we'll see uh, what all gets commissioned. I'm curious about it. Um. Oh, she loves Veronica Mars. Oh, that's cool. Uh, oh, the movie was a Kickstarter. I remember that now. I remember that being mentioned Yep, yep, yep. That rings a bell. All right. I got to wrap up. But thank you again very much to everybody for listening to Anya's for commissioning this. And thank you very much to Rachel for hanging out in the chat and feeding me people's lines and names and whatnot. Appreciate that a lot. Um, the fourth season is after the movie. Okay. Oh, huh. All right. Um, all right, guys. Well, stay tuned and we'll see how it all shakes out. And until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.